PFC Bradley Manning, who is uh, being prosecuted uh, for you know, various things and being accused of aiding the enemy. So just to establish that. So the main thing that I really that we really see pulling everything off, and, and so we could actually see what's going on with the Afghanistan war is the war logs release that took place in July 2010. And most significantly out of this, though it revealed aspects that related to Pakistan and Iran and also the Taliban, the main thing that really was, uh, I think, devastating to the United States is the fact that it showed that there were U.S. assassination squads being used called Task Force 373. And you have to think about this in perspective. This is before we really see uh, people um, lauding the assassinations of Osama bin Laden. This is, this is, when this comes out, people are actually finding it to be taboo to talk about Cheney using assassination squads as suspected. But now, as this comes out, it, you know, it creates this whole uh, ricochet effect of people just seeing how, basically they called them secret hunters, and they would go in, there was a Delta Force, they had a kill and capture list, and it was basically up to the assassination squad going in to decide whether to kill or capture the people that they were uh, going after. And I would assume that whatever they were doing was similar to night raids. And, and so just think about that for a moment because whatever intelligence they're using is the exact same intelligence that they're using to put people on Guantanamo. It's the exact same intelligence that they're using to render people and put them on airplanes and bring them overseas here. It's the same intelligence that Barack Obama and the whole counterterrorism apparatus is using to launch drone strikes against people. This doesn't change. The intelligence community has not matured, and we, we know that for a fact because they still let people slip through and attempt bombings on airplanes without actually catching them. So we know that they're not flawless people. The other thing, uh, you know, so from this release, uh, we really got to see what was going on in Afghanistan. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, these documents came from 2004 to 2009, showing lots of incident reports, um, and, th and they, were very, they were very good. So moving on, we, uh, some, some highlights from the cables release, because some of you might remember that in December 2010, there was uh, about, they started to release about a quarter of a million diplomatic cables from the U.S. State Department and they showed a lot from a range of countries. But what they so showed about Afghanistan um, was that, uh, and I want to read to you about this because I think it's quite fascinating, uh, because what happened is uh, they uncovered some documents that showed, they uncovered a cable from June 13, 2009 that showed um, what happened when, the, when NATO, the United States, and the Red Cross had been conspiring around a, the Bala Baluk massacre that occurred on May 4th, 2009. And basically what happened here is that there was a meeting and the leader of the Red Cross in Afghanistan, his name is Rado Stocker, compiled a report with exact figures on the deaths of civilians in an attack that had just taken place. And it had left a mosque in utter ruin they had turned the village into a, quote, an inferno of screaming, mangled, and bloody people. In the aftermath, the Taliban and Afghan officials claimed over 140 civilians had been killed. Eikenberry said, said at a news conference that we'll never know the exact number. So we have the U.S. ambassador claiming we could never know. We have the Red Cross commander saying dozens of people were killed. A commission investigated the incident and concluded that 26 civilians only and 78 Taliban fighters were killed. But what the cable showed is that, that uh, the process for putting this together. So the representatives visited Bala Baluk three times after May 4th to gather information. They interviewed local residents and they interviewed more than 50 villagers in, uh, in Ganyabad and Jirani over a period of 13 days. They avoided compiling lists of victims but did provide a complete list of interviewees in their report. And he, and so then what happens is he goes, Stucker, and he has his meeting, and he, said, he shares that his report has found that actually 89 civilians were killed and another 13 were injured. But in this whole course of this uh, discussion, he's basically ceding ground and talking about all the different ways that, you know, 
We found this, this is what the villagers told us, but more than likely, any people that came back to the bomb site were probably Taliban because why would innocent people want to come back to the carnage and hang around the site? So it doesn't really reflect, we're thinking that all in all, these numbers aren't exactly accurate. So this report ends up not being released at all, which was one of the big things about this release in my mind because it shows just, you know, we talk about the military, we talk about the cover up by the US government. There's actually a level of complicity from humanitarian and hum human rights organizations that self censor or silence themselves and don't share. And that's one of the things here uh, that was revealed. Um, and just to close, and just to close, uh, I would say that the disconnect between what is happening on the ground and what is happening here and how our population is insulated is directly reflected by the way that people in the United States reflect or, or react to leaks. Because most people in the United States have this utter revulsion of how dare you actually provide me information that I can have to better understand what is going on. I don't want to know. I just want to trust that the generals overseas are handling it and that everything is going to be okay. And the biggest example uh, beyond the Afghan war logs, beyond the cables and anything else that WikiLeaks has shown, you know, was a salient example of the Los Angeles Times publishing just two photos from a soldier that showed mangled corpses of suicide bombers from Afghanistan. And if you would go to the Los Angeles Times page and read all of the comments from people who were so angry that people in the Los Angeles Times had exercised freedom of yes. press and actually done their job. And actually, they didn't even publish all the photos they had. They published like two of 16 photos. They had more. And now these are people who are getting angry that a Los Angeles Times newspaper actually decided to publicize a concern of a soldier which is really absurd when you think about it because everyone in this country runs around talking about supporting the troops. Yet when somebody deployed over there wants us to know what's going on so that we can be on the same page, they get upset and get very angry and, and then we just hear about how you know, lives were endangered or we didn't hear anything new, which is the most biggest contradiction that anyone could ever make. Um, and in closing, uh, I want to just point out how similar Obama and Bush had a have actually been. Because this West Point speech that was described here, uh, of when 30,000 more troops were, take were sent to Afghanistan, uh, it is clear. Because in Obama's speech, he said, we did not ask for this fight. In a previous speech, Bush had said, we did not seek this conflict. Obama said, new attacks are being plotted as I speak. Bush said, at this moment, terrorists are planning new attacks. Obama, our cause is just, our resolve unwavering. Oh, yeah. Bush, our cause is just, our coalition is determined. Obama, this is no idle danger, no hypothetical threat. Bush, the enemies of freedom are not idle. Obama, we have no interest in occupying your country. Bush. I wouldn't be happy if I were occupied either. <laughs> but, you know, to, to wrap it all up, uh, everyone's going to go out and they're going to demonstrate and they're going to try to drive NATO and all the generals that come here and try to prolong the war in Afghanistan for 10, 15 more years to prolong the occupation. And, you know, if, if there was any doubts in the minds of Obama or Bush or any of these people that run this country or have run this country on what it feels like to be occupied, um, you know, we should show them over the weekend that's coming up what we really mean about occupying their mind and getting up in their business and telling them what's what.